and welcome back to my channel. Today we're looking at bonding and properties. Atoms bond to achieve stability. The only elements that don't bond are noble gases because they have a full outer shell of electrons already. There are different ways that atoms can achieve stability. So there are different types of bonding. Ionic bonding, covalent bonding in the form of molecular and network and metallic bonding. We're going to look at each of these types of bonding in turn. First of all, looking at ionic bonding. Metals can achieve a full outer shell of electrons by losing electrons to become positive ions. Non-metals can achieve a full outer shell of electrons by gaining electrons to become negative ions. Here we have an example of sodium and chlorine. The target diagrams can be drawn using page 6 of your data book where you have the electron configurations for each of the elements. The electron configuration for sodium is 2 8, 1, and for chlorine is 2, 8, 7. It's much easier for sodium to lose the one outer electron than it is for chlorine to lose 7. So this one outer electron can be moved and transferred to the chlorine. This now leaves sodium with an electron arrangement of 2, 8, like its nearest noble gas neon, whereas chlorine is now 2, 8, 8, like its nearest noble gas argon. As the central charge on the nucleus is 11 plus, and now we only have 10 electrons, this means that sodium becomes a positive ion. Chlorine has a charge on the nucleus of 17 plus, whereas now it has 18 electrons, which means that this becomes a negative ion. The electrostatic attraction between the positive and negative ions is called an, an, an ionic bond. This is a 3D effect resulting in a, 3D, a large 3D lattice of alternating positive and negative ions. The formula of an ionic compound is the simplest ratio of the positive and negative ions present. Covalent bonding happens between non-metals. There are two types of covalent bonding, covalent molecular and covalent network. Non-metals can achieve stability by sharing any unpaired outer electrons that they have. The attraction of the two nuclei for the shared pair of electrons is called a covalent bond. We can represent covalent bonds using dot and cross diagrams. Here we can bring in each of the hydrogen atoms to share their electrons with the unpaired electrons of the oxygen to make water. Now oxygen has a full outer shell of 8 electrons and hydrogen has a full outer shell of 2. Covalent molecules exist as discrete molecules with a fixed formula, which represents the number of atoms present. Let's try and draw some more dot and cross diagrams. To draw a dot and cross diagram, you only need to show the outer electrons of the elements. So for methane, CH4, we have carbon, and if you look on page 6 of the data book, you'll see that the electron arrangement for carbon is 2,4. That means we only need to show the four outer electrons. Electrons go into the shell as one, two, three, four unpaired electrons before they would start to pair up. So we have four single electrons for the carbon. Hydrogen has an electron arrangement of one, and we can bring each of these four hydrogens to pair up with each of these single electrons from the carbon. And this is our dot and cross or outer electron diagram for methane. The electrons of molecules can cause different shapes. The shapes that we're looking at are linear, bent or non-linear, trigonal pyram pyramidal and tetrahedral. An example of a linear molecule would be something like HF. where we only have the single bond here between the two atoms. Water is an example of a bent or non-linear molecule, as is the sulphur version, SH2. This is because both water and sulphur have two lone pairs of electrons which push this bond angle down rather than them being in a straight line. Trigonal pyramidal compounds, such as ammonia, NH3, and P2, 
pH 3 have a shape that looks like a pyramid because they each have a lone pair on the central atom which pushes these bonds down rather than them being in a trigonal planar arrangement. Methane is an example of a tetrahedral molecule. There are four pairs of electrons around about the carbon in the centre and they try to get as far away from each other as possible so you end up with a tetrahedral arrangement rather than a square planar cross arrangement. Try drawing outer electron diagrams for the following compounds using page 6 of your databook to help you. The first compound we're looking at is hydrogen chloride. So, hydrogen has one outer electron which I will represent in black and chlorine which I will represent as green has seven. We need to overlap the shells now chlorine has seven electrons which will fill as four single electrons before pairing and this leaves our one single electron paired up with the hydrogen. Sulfur hydride. I'll represent sulfur in black. So here we have sulfur and it has six outer electrons. So one, two, three, four, five and six. Hydrogen, which we've just drawn, has only one, so we'll overlap here. So there's one of our hydrogens, and we just keep filling up until both of the elements present have full outer shells. Phosphorus fluoride, I'm going to represent phosphorus in black. Phosphorus has five outer electrons. Again, they will fill as single electrons first before pairing. So we have one pair and three single electrons. Fluorine has seven electrons, which means that it has three pairs and one single. So the single electron can pair up with the single electron of phosphorus, and it will need to do this three times so that phosphorus gets a full outer shell of electrons. So now phosphorus has eight outer electrons as do all three of the fluorine atoms. Carbon dioxide. So carbon has four outer electrons and I'm going to draw them in a slightly different arrangement. They're not paired up, they're just at either side. Dioxide would imply we only have two oxygens, and oxygen has two unpaired electrons in its outer shell. This means that we form double covalent bonds here on either side. Where now the carbon has eight outer electrons and as does the oxygen. And the final example can be quite tricky to draw. If you draw nitrogen as we have been doing, where you have one, two, three, four, and then five, it can be quite difficult to overlap. So I'm going to redraw it, but this time I'm going to shift those three unpaired electrons to be closer to the bottom so we get an easier overlap. Nitrogen ends up with a triple covalent bond. So you have six electrons here shared between the two nitrogen atoms. Covalent bonding can also occur in a network fashion. These are structures with large 3D lattices of covalently bonded atoms. The most common are silica, SiO2, carbon in the form of graphite and carbon in the form of diamond. The formula for a covalent network, much like an ionic compound, is the simplest ratio of the elements present. So for both graphite and diamond, that will just be C. For SiO2, you can see here in the picture, for every grey silicon that we have present, there are two red oxygens. The final type of bonding is that of metallic bonding. This only happens for metallic elements. And this is where we have a regular repeating arrangement of positive cores 
and delocalized outer electrons which are able to move between all of the positive cores. This is what allows metals to conduct electricity as when a current is passed through this the electrons can start to move because they are already freely moving within the structure. Let's have a look at the properties of the different types of bonding. For ionic bonding, the melting and boiling points are very high. This is because ionic bonds are very strong and as you have a 3D lattice, you need to break all of the ionic bonds to be able to melt or boil the compound. Conduction, ionic compounds will not conduct as solids. Conduction, ionic compounds will not conduct as solids as there's no free charges but they will when they are molten or aqueous. This is because you've broken the bonds between the ions and they're able to now move and carry a current. Solubility, they tend to be soluble in water as water is slightly polar and can be attracted to the positive and negative ions in the compound. Covalent molecules tend to have very low melting and boiling points. When you're melting a covalent molecule, you're separating the two molecules away from each other. You're not breaking the strong covalent bonds. Therefore, it's quite easy to overcome the weak interactions between the molecules. Conduction. Covalent molecules never conduct. There are no free charges for them to carry the current. And they tend to be um, insoluble in water. However, they can be soluble in other non-polar solvents. Covalent networks have very high melting and boiling points because you are trying to break the covalent bonds when you're melting a covalent network. There are many, many covalent bonds to be broken, so this need, needs a lot of energy to be able to melt. Conduction, they don't conduct because there are no free charges except for graphite. Soluble, they are insoluble. And finally, metallic. Melting and boiling points tend to be quite high, apart from for mercury, where it is a liquid at room temperature. They always conduct and they are insoluble. Here's a final two questions for you to try. Number one, which line in the table shows the properties of an ionic substance? Number two, which of the following diagrams could be used to represent the structure of a covalent network? Pause the video now and try the questions. Okay, so for question one, we're looking for the properties of an ionic substance. Ionic substances have very high melting and boiling points. So our options would be B, C and D for very high melting and boiling points. And ionic substances will conduct electricity when they are in the liquid state only. So that would be C. So our answer must be C. Which of the following diagrams could be used to represent the structure of a covalent network? A covalent network is a lattice of covalently bonded atoms, which means you must need to see the bonds between the atoms, and this should continue on a long range scale. A shows positive cores with delocalized electrons, so that is metallic bonding. B shows alternating positive and negative ions, so that's ionic bonding. C shows small discrete molecules with covalent bonds between them, so this is covalent molecular, and D shows a large lattice with covalent bonds between each of the atoms, so D is our answer. Thank you for watching my video, I hope that you found it helpful. Please remember to subscribe and follow me on Twitter at Miss Adams Kemp for regular updates on new videos. Bye for now!